Good morning. Will you pray with me? God, we are so grateful for this day. We are so grateful for this opportunity we have to gather in this place and to worship you. And God, just as you have spoken to us your message of love through the songs, through the prayers, through the warm, friendly faces, through the delicious coffee that has been prepared, through, through all the ways that you are present with us in this place, we give you thanks. But now as we turn towards scripture once again, Lord, we pray that you will speak to us. So that each of us, from our different paths of life, our different places and our journeys of faith, we may hear from you. Father, as the preacher, I pray that you will speak in me, through me, and if necessary, Lord, speak in spite of me. So that all of us will hear what you would say to each and every one of us this day. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So, when I was in the first grade, I started playing soccer. And in the first grade, I did not have a lot of athletic ability, neither did most of the other players on the team. Uh, in the first grade, I don't know if y'all played soccer in the first grade, but what it looked like for, for, for me and my friends was, was a school of fish chasing after a little white ball, and we went wherever the ball went. Yeah. And we didn't really kick, we didn't pass, we didn't shoot. It was just chase after the ball until somebody would inevitably get kicked in the shin, fall down crying. We'd all pause for five minutes, get a drink of water. Then a whistle would blow and we'd be right back after it. That was our soccer ability in the first grade. But there were two kids uh, in my grade, uh, Seth and Chuck. And they were light years ahead of the rest of, the, of us. They, they, they were good at soccer for first graders. Like they could kick the ball and they approximately knew where the ball was going to end up before they kicked it. That was just staggering to the rest of us who, who were just chasing after trying to kick it to begin with. But they, they, they could dribble, they could shoot, they could score. So what ended up happening is the first day uh, 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 of the league, everybody showed up, we got our shirts, and we were all uh, at the same soccer fields looking at each other, and we were able to assess pretty quickly which teams had a chance to win the trophy. Either Seth's team or Chuck's team. Because if you had one of the really good players, then you had a chance to win, but, but, but the rest of us, we weren't very good. Like, it didn't really matter whether we showed up or not. It didn't matter if we tried hard or not, because the only thing that mattered was if Seth or Chuck showed up on their team and that they tried hard because they had the ability to win the game. So my paradigm for team sports coming out of the first grade was it doesn't matter what most people do, it just matters that those who are really good at what they do show up and try hard. The rest of us just show up to have fun. Well, that was my understanding of team sports until I got into middle school and I started playing hockey. Now, once again, I apologize. I'm going to keep apologizing for this, y'all. I'm a Yankee. I can't control it. It is what it is. It's out there. You can do whatever you want with it. But I'm a Yankee from New Jersey, and just like y'all love you some football down here, we love us some hockey up north. And, and, and contrary to popular belief in New Jersey, it does not get cold enough to keep ice on the ground year-round. So we played hockey on rollerblades. And, and the way it worked is, is a bunch of my friends and I would go down to the cul-de-sac that we lived on, and we started a hockey team. And, and in my neighbor or in my township, there were a bunch of other neighborhoods with cul-de-sacs where kids had had started teams, and we all liked to play each other. And, and on our team, we had one uh, offensive center and one goalie that were awesome. When they showed up, we had a good chance of winning the game. So at, at first blush, it might appear that, that my understanding of the hockey team was going to be like the soccer team, that it only mattered if the really good people showed up. But what I, what I started to notice is upon closer inspection, each person on my team was vital to the team. See, check this out. I might have been a mediocre defensive player at best, but I had a mom that owned a Suburban, y'all. 
And you can't get from one cul-de-sac to the other one to play a game and back before dark without that Suburban. So I was crucial to the team, not because of what I brought uh, on the field or on, on, the, on the cul-de-sac, so to speak, but, but because I had transportation. Likewise, the, the kid that lived next to me, once again, pretty mediocre defensive player. But his mom had snack. And if you've ever had middle schoolers in your house, then you know that middle schoolers like snack. If you've experienced that, can you say amen? Okay, yeah, yeah. Middle schoolers love snack time. And we would go and invade my neighbor's house from 4 to 4.30, just plucking all the juice and grapes or whatever pretzels were there. And I could go through the rest of the list. Everybody on the team brought something. Everybody was vital to the success of the team. We could not be our best without everybody participating and everybody bringing what they have to offer. And I bring that up today because I think sometimes in our journeys of faith when we, when we look at what the church is and how the church operates, especially a church the size of Buncombe Street, it can be really easy to think that church is a lot like the soccer team where, where the only people that matter are the few really good people who do what they do. The musicians, the, the speakers, the greeters. But the reality is, is we as a church, when we're at our best, we're like the hockey team. For the outside looking in, everybody might not see how vital each person is. But everybody, everybody is important in the life of the church. And to help us have this conversation, I want to invite you to get your Bibles out or you can follow along on the screen. Uh, we are going to be reading from the Gospel according to Matthew from chapter 25 starting at verse 14. Jesus says, for it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To the one he gave five talents, to another two, and another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one with the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been in trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. But then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you do not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground here you have what is yours. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy slave! You knew, did you, that I, I reap where I do not sow and I gather where I did not scatter. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and on my return I would have received what was mine with interest. So take the talent from him, give it to the one with ten talents. For to all who have, more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right. So a talent is a large sum of money. 
This passage is talking about being faithful with money. So I've got a question for you. If you woke up this morning with goosebumps on your forearms and, and, and just restless anticipation to come to church, hoping explicitly that I would talk about tithing today, can you say hallelujah? <laughs> All right. We're not doing that. It's okay. It's safe. I gave you all a little bit of a panic attack there. You're like, oh man, I should have slept in today. He's talking about, no, we're not talking about money. It's safe. Um, we're talking about talents. And, and while the, 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 the word talent does mean money, uh, in today's English, talent means God's given ability. For example, uh, when you turn on the TV show, America's Got Talent, you don't anticipate turning on the TV to watch people count money. I got this money and this one. Like that, that would be a really boring show. No. We turn on America's Got Talent to see people with God-given abilities who have cultivated that gift, that talent. And the reason the English word talent means God-given ability is this story. See, the church has been telling this story, this passage, over and over and over again, understanding that it means not just money, but also our gifts and abilities that God has given us. So I want to talk about the gifts that God has given us today. And, and this passage reminds us that, that any gift or ability that we have is a gift from God. God gave it to us. So before you were born, when God was creating you, unique, special, God gave you talents whether you've discerned what your talents are yet or not, or whether you've cultivated your talents yet or not, doesn't matter. There's talent in you. God has given it to you. You are a special and beautiful creature, handmade by a loving God. So, so our talents are given to us by God, and we are called to be like the first two slaves who, who, who take the talents that they are entrusted with, and they go out and they take risk, but they work to cultivate those talents, to, to grow those talents so they can shine and, and give more glory to the master. Likewise, whatever talent is in you, God gave you so that you could let your light shine. So that you could take that talent and foster it and, and watch it blossom right before your eyes. We should not be like the third slave. Who, who, who took the talent and rather than doing anything with it to, 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 to make it prosperous. He took the talent and he buried it in the ground. Hiding it. And he did it because he was scared. It was insecurity that, 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 that crippled this servant and, and prevented this servant from doing anything with a talent. A fear of failure, a fear of disappointment. And as a result, the, the master comes back and says, you wicked slave. That, I didn't give this to you for you to do nothing with it. I entrusted you specifically, uniquely, so that you could take this talent and make it fruitful for the kingdom. And that's what we're called to do. We are called to take the talents that God has given us and not hide them in the ground, but, but use them for the glory of God. Cultivate them and then give them back to God for service in God's kingdom. And, and I don't know about you, I remember when I was a kid, I'd hear this passage, and I always found the ending troublesome. This idea of it, that those who have more will be given, and, and those who have little, what little they have will be taken away. And I thought, man, what, what's going on? Is God going to sneak into my bedroom in the middle of the night and zap me so I lose what little talent I have uh, playing bad hockey? But that's, that's not what's happening here. Uh, I want to do a quick exercise. You can remain seated. Don't worry, we're not doing calisthenics. But I want anybody who took uh, uh, a class on a musical instrument at some point in time in their life to go ahead and raise your hand. That's a lot of hands. I want you to keep the hand up if you are just as good today as you were when you were at your best. If you have lost some of that, 
Okay. Uh, similar question. Not everybody played musical instrument, but I'll, I like participation. If you took a, a, a language other than English at some point in time in high school, middle school, or college, go ahead. Hands up. All right. A lot of hands again. Now, if you were just as fluent today as you were at your best, go ahead and keep your hand up, and we got a few. All right. I took piano lessons. I could struggle through chopsticks. If you're really lucky, I might be able to get Mary's Had a Little Lamb. It'll be shaky at best, though. And, and, and I did take three years of Spanish. I remember De Donde Estal Biblioteca, which I'm probably not even saying right anymore, but I think I just asked, where's the library? Which is a fundamentally useless question to remember, but I don't remember anything else. So, so what happens is, is we are given talent that we can foster, whether it's music, whether it's athleticism, whether it's language, whether it's math, whatever it is, we are given talent that is inside of us and we can cultivate these talents. And the people who are in connection with who God made them to be, they, they, they understand the talents that God has given them and, and, and they cultivate them and it looks like they have many, many, many talents. When in reality, we all have talents, but the people who, who never pause to say, wait a minute, what what talents has God given me? And then cultivate those talents. It seems like they don't have any. It's not that it's not in them. It just appears that way. And, and God's not actually going to take away your talent. But if, if you don't use it, you lose it. it. It just withers on the vine. Like our language classes or music or whatever else it might be. So here's the thing. You are special. You are unique. You are talented. And God has given you those gifts and those talents so that you can cultivate them. So that you can let your light shine. And so that you can take those talents and give them back to God to use for the glory of God. See, I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to the person next to you. I'm not talking to the person in front of you or behind you. I'm talking to you. You have talent that God imparted to you before you were born. And God looked out on the horizon of time and God saw where you were going to be in life. And God saw that you would spend a season here at Buncombe Street if this is your church home or wherever your church home is. And God gifted you specifically to cultivate your talents for this season. It might not be the same talents you used last season. It might not be the same talents you use next season. But, but God gifted you for service in God's kingdom in the here and the now. And if we're going to be the church that God is calling us to be, then we need all of us to be faithful in praying, God, what gift have you given me? And, and, and then to cultivate that gift. And then, and then to use that gift to, to glorify God. I'll give you an example. There were a lot of hands that went up when we talked about playing a musical instrument. There's some musical talent in you. If it's just chopsticks, I can relate. But, but there's musical talent in a lot of people. And Daniel does a great job, and Emily does a great job, and the volunteers here do a great job, as well as the choir and the people upstairs, as well as the people over at our Trinity campus. Those who are already serving do a great job. But God has given this church an even greater gift of music that is not fully tapped into yet. We can do more. Imagine if all those hands that went up just spent a little bit of time rekindling that, that passion, that love of music to, to make that talent shine just a little bit brighter once again and to take that gift and pour it back into the life of the church. Think of the, the worship we could have. I know we already do a great job here at the downtown campus at, at all four of the services, but we can be even better, y'all. And then over at the Trinity campus, I don't know if you've been there. I hope you'll swing by sometime. God is doing some amazing things. One of the things we've realized is our choir is Reno City. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the tagline for Reno. They're the, the biggest little city. 
we have the biggest little choir. It's not big in number, but it's big in sound. But one of the things that we understand is if we are going to be the church that can be relevant in this community on Augusta Road, we need to bolster our music program before we relaunch. We need to make sure that, that, that our choir has a more rounded out sound and, and we have more instrumentation surrounding the, the, the worship service so, so, so that when people walk in the door, they can experience the beauty of God through music. Likewise, we have children's ministry. We have an awesome children's ministry here at Buncombe Street United Methodist Church. If you know that to be true, can you say amen? We got a great children's program. You know what can make it better? You. If you have a talent to love children, to nurture them, we need you. Now, maybe, maybe you, you've d developed your talent uh, of children's ministry to the point where you want to write your own curriculums and cut out all of the arts and crafts on your own and bring that to, to the class. If you're at that level, great. We need you. But you know what? Maybe you said a prayer and God laid it on your heart to, to be a part of children's ministry and you don't know what that means yet. Maybe all you know is you love children and you care about them, but you're not, you're not really sure how to teach them the Bible because you don't feel so solid about knowing the Bible yet yourself. You don't want to say the wrong thing. That's okay. We need you. We will do more and do better with your help. And that's just two things. That's, that's music and children. The, the, the church is overflowing with opportunities. We are an amazing church today. And we will be an even greater church tomorrow when all the people who are called to be a part of the life of this church plug in. So say all of that to say this. The church is like the hockey team. Please don't ever think that you are not important. You being here on Sunday morning is important to the life of this church and to God. And the talents that God has given you were entrusted to you so that you could develop them and in part give them back to God in service through God's church. And this is a great and safe place to cultivate your talent because if you don't use it, you lose it. And God didn't give you your talent to be squandered. Don't bury it in the backyard. Don't let your insecurity stand in between you and the beautiful life that God has in store for you. And know that, that, that being a faithful disciple is not something we can ever retire from. Using our talents faithfully to God's glory is not something that we did in the past, but we don't do in the now and the future. That... that that being a Christian means that we give our lives back over to God who gives us life as long as we have life in these bodies. And we take what we've been entrusted with, cultivate it, and give it back. Friends, will you pray with me? God, you have given us so much, and we are so grateful. There are gifts and talents that we have discerned and even more that, that, that we haven't discerned yet. God, we pray that, that you will help us to be strong and to be brave. Don't let insecurity rob us of, of the opportunities before us to be even better, to let our lights shine even brighter for your kingdom. And help us as the church to be the place that helps people connect with the gifts that God has given each and every one of us. So that we can cultivate those talents and turn them back over to you. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.